Hey everyone, it's Professor Ellis with week 12, if you can believe it, of technical writing. Uh, this is uh, English 2575, both for OL83 and OL88 sections. I hope that you're all doing well, that you're hanging in there, uh, that you are healthy and safe. I know I've received emails from several students uh, in the different classes that I'm teaching this semester who have been ill or have been having to care for uh, your family members that were ill. Um, not just uh, of COVID-19, but also of the flu. Uh, so make sure that you are all doing your best to stay healthy, you're getting plenty of rest, eating well, masking up, maintaining social distance when you're around others. Um, and you know, when you get the opportunity to get your vaccine, please jump on it. Uh, less, this past week, I got my first uh, Moderna shot. Uh, I'll be getting my second shot uh, on May 19th. Um, this is something that's kind of all of our responsibility to do, so I can't encourage you strongly enough to take care of that so that you can protect yourself and, more importantly, protect others. Um, so whatever vaccine you have an opportunity to get, you take it, whatever it is. Um, and you, above all else, just hang in there uh, as we get through this semester, because uh, we're almost there. The light should be at the end of the tunnel for all of us. Uh, to see this thing through. Uh, I know that, the, that this class in particular is asking a lot of you, uh, but I hope that you've planned ahead as much as you can, uh, considering everything is on the syllabus that we have going on and what's expected of you. Um, so you just have to hang in there and work together, pull together uh, with your team uh, to get these projects done that we're going to talk about, uh, that we've been talking about and we'll continue talking about today. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump in uh, to this week's uh, lecture. So first off, uh, I want to point out to you about the course evaluation emails. You should have already received uh, in your City Tech official email um, emails concerning course evaluations for all the classes that you're taking right now, including mine. Uh, I highly, highly, highly recommend you take care of that as soon as you can. Um, basically, each email should have a link for that particular class. You click the link and then you fill out um, the feedback form on each class. Um, that kind of feedback is absolutely uh, important and useful to all of us uh, instructors and professors at City Tech. Uh, so I can't you know, um, ask you in any uncertain terms how helpful it is to me to receive your feedback. So please take the time to do that. It's really useful to me, not just in terms of me seeing like you know, how the class worked whenever I look at the results of this uh, next semester, but it's also useful for me in the way that I try to adjust and edit and change my class and my teaching from semester to semester. Because you can imagine as time goes by, uh, my students are different, what their needs are different, what they come to the class with is different. And so I get a little bit of you know, indication of how I need to adjust to accommodate my students in the future based on these past evaluations. Um, but perhaps more importantly than just what you bubble in for the different questions uh, are the written comments that you leave. If you got ideas about how uh, your things that you liked about the class, how to make the class better, uh, maybe different ideas for assignments or things that you'd like to see me do in the future, you write all that in. Because uh, all that kind of feedback are things that I'll listen to. Um, you know, and everything is anonymous, so like I don't know who says what, uh, and I don't see the results until next semester. So nothing you, you put into the, the evaluations will affect your grade in any way whatsoever. Okay, So it's completely uh, anonymous and uh, even with it being anonymous, I appreciate anything that you can say uh, about the class that you, you thought worked, things that didn't work as good, you know, things that might improve the class in the future, all that kind of stuff. Please let me know in the, stu in the course evaluations. Uh, and you have in from now until May 14th to fill those out. So I'll remind you guys in, in future lectures up until then um, to fill those out uh, in case maybe you overlooked it or, or forgot about it. Now for our class day, the main things that we need to go over have to do with continuing to work on the collaborative team-based project. Um, and those things are going to involve 
uh, team communication, which we've talked a lot about before that I know that many of you, you have already like really you know, dove into, uh, but just uh, you know, we'll make some comments on that. Um, some other ideas to help you think about the research report, even though at this point you should have a problem that you're researching. Uh, and then the other two big deliverables, um, the presentation and website. Now with the presentation and website, I'm not expecting you to be at a point where you're actually doing those things, making those things yet, because you have to have the research report in some finalized stage before you can turn it into your presentation and the website. But I do want you to see the big picture of all the other parts of the project so you can begin delegating who can take point on these particular deliverables. And when I say take point, these will be the people that aren't necessarily doing all of the work, but they're taking on the responsibility of working with the other team members to get their parts done and completed that will go into these parts of the project. Um, so the point person for the presentation, for example, uh, may be in charge of like setting up the Zoom meeting uh, that you'll hold and record for your presentation video. Uh, and likewise for the website, one person should be in charge of actually creating the Open Lab project site. Um, they may also be in charge of you know, redesigning it to match the parameters of the assignment, uh, but others may also chip in with, with that work as well. And then finally, we'll talk about discuss homework, research, writing, delegating, um, that you should be doing now and the weekly writing assignment which you're going to together as a team write a very short memo addressed to me uh, the subject can simply be delegating task and in that memo you'll want to tell me who is taking point on the research report who is taking point on the presentation and who is taking point on the website there could be overlap of these things if you like if you're in a smaller team uh, as opposed to a larger team uh, but there's not an expectation one person takes on all these different tasks unless of course maybe your team decides that one person you know, has those skill sets wants to do that um, but I don't want anyone to think there's an expectation that this falls on the shoulders of one individual uh, in the team this is something that needs to be delegated out so that the different tasks are shared um, and hopefully drawing on different strengths that your team members have. Uh, and I'll remind you about this at the end of today's lecture. So just a review of what we covered with the research report uh, last week. Remember the main three components that go into the research report uh, is the research on the problem, what is its history, how did it come about, how, what's going on with it now, the research on the solutions to the problem, and these are potential solutions that people have done, that people have tried, what are their histories, you know, which things have seemed to worked out, which haven't uh, panned out, and then finally recommendations. And the recommendations are you as a team coming together to say, based on what we know about the problem, based on what we know about these, these different solutions, these are recommendations on how to fix this problem. So you really everything is coming down to the recommendations as that being your argument. If you want to think about the research report as an argumentative essay, which I imagine you've, you've dealt with before in English 1101 and 1121, is your argument needs to be supported by evidence. The evidence for that argument you're making for these recommendations is the research you do on the problem and the research you do on the solution. So these are the things that are going to support what you have to say in your recommendations. So everything's leading up to that point in your essay. We went over the sample outline of the different parts and also gave you a copy of that on our Open Lab site. Again, that's a recommendation. Uh, you can use you know, different headings if you like. You can combine some of those different sections together, which is also okay. Uh, but those different parts need to be addressed in what you write in your uh, research report. And then uh, finally, doing research. 
remember you need to rely on the library. You know, we got tons of ebooks. We have all those research articles in the databases that you can draw on. For the research that you do in the project, if you want to think about you know, this technical writing class, you know, it's obviously an English class. It's one that's requiring a, tr a good amount of time outside of class. Uh, but you know, I didn't assign any books in this class. The reading that goes into most of the work you're doing is the research for these different projects. You did research by finding an article for the very first project where you summarize it. For the expanded definition, you need to do more research, you had to do more reading in order to find out you know, about the term you selected, its history, how it gets used, etc. And then with your instruction manual, again, you could support the things that you had to say about those specific tasks that you're directing someone how to do involve some kind of research. It may be you know, some reading, some experience you already had, uh, but many of you also would have drawn on research um, that would have supported you know, the things that you're trying to teach people how to do in your instruction manual. And similarly with this, you have a lot more research to do because you're, you're looking at a specific problem, uh, but you know, it's a scientific or technical problem, so that means there's probably going to be a lot of information that you're going to need to convey in your report. And also, as I said last time, that the project is scalable. Okay, It's like an accordion. You, know, you can make it smaller, make it big, right? Well, the idea here is I don't want anyone to be freaking out uh, if like, they have some team members that are not involved. Those team members that are involved, you become the decision makers. You become the people that are going to be making this project happen. And you are the ones that will be receiving the reward of a grade on the project. Those that don't contribute, that don't take part in the project, obviously won't be getting a grade on this. Um, and that's to their detriment. But for those of you that are contributing, we remember that the guidelines on the syllabus is that it needs to be a, let's why don't we go over there real quick. Here's the syllabus for OL88 section. Same is true for OL83. Four thousand to six thousand word analytical research report. But this is what is going to be key is each team member contributes 1,000 to 1,500 words. So like if, even though your team may have six members, but only three members are actually showing up and doing the work, I'm not expecting you to, to knock it out of the park with a 4,000 word research report. You would scale that back down uh, at a minimum being 3,000 words, 1,000 words per member that's actually contributing to the project. Um, if anybody has questions about that, just you drop me an email or come by and talk to me during office hours. The whole team doesn't have to be there. You can say, you know, you, you talking amongst your team members, who has time to meet with Professor Ellis to ask these questions? Well, that person you delegate that responsibility to, they meet with me and then they report back to you about what we discussed, okay? So that's not a problem. That's something that you know, I, I expect you guys to do uh, when you have questions. But I also set that out uh, up front because I, I don't want anybody to, you know, blow a gasket, have a stroke, you know, anything terrible happen because your stress level is so high um, that I'm willing to work with teams to make sure that there is, you know, fairness in terms of like what each individual member needs to do to make the project happen. Because um, I know that, that even when we meet in person in the best of circumstances, this project is difficult, um, but that doesn't mean that it's impossible. Because as I was, we'll take a look at later, you know, I've had you know a number of students complete these projects no problem, um, with you know minor hiccups, uh, some hurdles that they had to overcome, uh, but eventually the project gets done. So I know that you all can do that as well. Uh, but the big part of it is actually showing up, contributing with your team, communicating with your team. Uh, so that you all can work together to make this thing happen. Now, looking back uh, from our review last week with doing research, remember that everything that you're using from other sources, it needs to be quoted, in quotation marks. It needs to be followed by parenthetical citations using APA format. And remember, all you gotta do is go to your favorite search engine and type in Purdue OWL, O-W-L, APA. And that's going to take you to 
the Purdue OWL website um, for the, in the APA section. And it gives you all the information for in-text citations. That's what I, is a synonymous, meaning the same thing as when I say parenthetical citations. Uh, it gives you all the information you need about the reference list. And remember, your reference list entries need to be alphabetized by the author's last name, the first author that's listed. So make sure you remember to do that. A lot of folks have been forgetting that on some of the earlier assignments that we've already had graded. Um, primary research. I had mentioned last time that some teams in the past, depending on what they're researching, um, might use questionnaires that they share like uh, with people they know, that they could post on social media, they could send out via email to groups of uh, friends at City Tech or, or other places. That's also fair game. Uh, you set up um, a Google form uh, so that you can have the questions and a selection for the answers collect that data together, and then you can use that as a part of your research that goes into um, your research report. Uh, of course, a part of that would go into methodology where you talk about like how you did it, how you set up the questions. Um, then when you talk about results, not only do you want to say like you know, how, what percentage of people responded with answer A versus B, but you need to talk about things about your sample size, how many people responded, uh, so that it tells your reader more about the validity of the results that you've gotten um, based on like what you know how many people are actually giving responses and you know, maybe other information about demographics of these people etc uh, so that's the primary research most of the research though is secondary that you're doing which involves stuff through the library and then with all of your sources that you're quoting from from those library sources and maybe some sources online uh, just on the, the internet make sure that you're always evaluating contextualizing and explaining so again you need to let us know where does this information come from even if it's something that's in a peer-reviewed journal you should say something about the authors like you know, are they a prof professor at such and such college or are they a researcher at Microsoft uh, whatever it might be that tells your reader a little bit more about where that information is coming from, who was involved in producing it. Um, contextualize it. Is this information that is you know, from the past year, or is it research that took place 20 years ago? Because, uh, I mean, that matters, especially with scientific and technical problems, uh, because you so much changes so quickly in these fields. And then explaining. So a good rule of thumb uh, for every line of text that you quote, you should be writing at least that much of your own writing um, as an explanation for like what it means, how it connects to your overall discussion. Um, don't just put a quote there and let it stand on its own. Every quote needs to be explained by you, letting the reader understand you know, what it means and how it relates to what it is you're talking about, okay? And again, when you start thinking about, you know, just pragmatically, when you start thinking about pulling in these quotes, providing the citations, explaining what they mean, you can imagine your word count is just going to be skyrocketing. You find a lot of sources that are useful and meaningful to what you're talking about in terms of problem solutions and recommendations, you the the word count is going to do itself usually when students start this project they begin procrastinating because they think that this is really overwhelming a lot of writing to do in a short amount of time but I guarantee you if you sit down and do the research which that itself will take time okay like I've said before for every you know credit hour of a class you need to be spending twice as much outside of class on your homework and this is part of your homework is this team-based assignment so this is a three-hour class. You need to be spending at least six hours outside of class just on the homework part of it. Now, I know that's not true. It's something that you need to do all the time. But right now, with something that does weigh so much heavily on your grade, that's why you know, I signaled to you through the syllabus and giving you a heads up early in the semester how you need to prioritize and think ahead for how you plan out the time you spend on these assignments because this is where it matters more 
uh, in a lot of ways because it's not just your grade on the line, it's your team's grade on the line for those that are participating. So spend that time, do that reading, do this work because it's not just about getting the project done and having a deliverable that I can grade and you get done with the class and you graduate. Always be thinking about how this is going to matter to you outside of the class. Make this meaningful to you for when you get out of here. Because by producing a good assignment, a good website, a good report, good presentation, you can link to these things from like your LinkedIn.com profile, your personal website, your online portfolio through Open Lab. And it's a way of showing that you have communication skills, it shows that you know how to do research, it shows you know how to work on a team. These are valuable assets um, that show off how you are capable of working in the modern technology focused workplace. Um, and it's one thing to like say you can do these things, but being able to prove it means so much. Um, so be thinking about how you can leverage this once the class is over as well. Now what I wanted to add uh, to what I talked about last week in the lecture is think about how this is reusing skills both from the assignments we've had in our class and things you already know how to do from your earlier English classes. So think about like a lot of the work that goes into the research report is simply summarizing the research of others. It's like you're doing that first assignment in our class a whole bunch of times. Uh, you know, for every quote, write as much explanation as the length of the quote or more. Cite everything that you're taking from some other source. And then I do want to give you a reminder about academic integrity. So I'm going to go back over to our syllabus. And you know, I read this when we talked about the syllabus on the first day of class. So this is the college policy on academic integrity. Uh, students who work with information, ideas, and texts owe their audience and sources accuracy and honesty in using, crediting, and citing sources. As a community of intellectual and professional workers, the college recognizes its responsibility for providing instruction in information literacy and academic integrity, offering models of good practice, and responding vigilantly and appropriately to infractions of academic integrity. Accordingly, Academic dishonesty is prohibited in CUNY and at New York City College of Technology and is punishable by penalties including failing grades, suspension, and expulsion. The complete text of the college policy on academic integrity may be found in the academic catalog here, which I gave you a link to. So at the heart of this that I think matters the most for uh, our assignments is make sure that you're always quoting and citing the sources that you use in our assignments, in, in the assignments in our class. Um, what's really important is that you're distinguishing the ideas and the writing of other people from your own. That you're giving credit where credit is due to those words and ideas that are written by other people that you're incorporating into your research report. Now, another way of thinking about this is that your research report is a way of entering into a conversation with others about the problem that you're doing research on. That conversation is what we call discourse. Discourse is these large conversations that we have in public about different topics. You know, we can have discourse about, uh, say, uh, gun rights, discourse about um, the right measures for protecting ourselves from COVID-19. All of these are different discourses where different people participate in public conversations. Those conversations can be like you know, videos on YouTube as well as videos on the news. They can be things that people put in writing, whether it be on social media or on the New York Times. All of these are a part of that discourse. And for you, writing this research report, you're entering into that discourse with what you write in the research report and what you put into your presentation and put into the website. All of these things are going to be a part of that discourse. But the thing about discourse is that when you're entering these conversations, the way to do it you know, correctly, uh, with integrity, um, ethically, is to always cite the sources that you're entering into conversation with. That's the quotes that you're including in your writing. 
because you're taking this writing that someone else has done putting it into your report but you need to give them credit saying that this came from these folks over here and then you're going to explain it and incorporate it in your discussion and so it's like you are having a conversation with those people that you're quoting in your research report that is a part of discourse taking place is when that happens so even though they're not right here you're not having that face-to-face -face talk with them you're still having a conversation with them but in writing and the way we do that uh, as um, you know ethical uh, academics ethical technical writers and technical communicators is to always quote and cite that work correctly and that's where APA comes in to help us do that we follow the APA format then we're doing that correctly um, now as you know, we go through the project if anybody has any questions about this please just shoot me an email jls at citytech.cuny.edu ask me am I doing this right are we doing this right um, or if there's concerns about you know maybe something that someone has contributed to your team project that you want to talk to me about uh, please reach out because the important thing is that you check with me beforehand if there's any questions rather than you know either doing something on purpose or making an egregious mistake that could you know impact your grade on the assignment because um, you should be aware if you're not already that any um, infraction of the academic integrity policy has to be uh, reported to the college and that's something my hands are tied on I have to fill out a form um, write everything up your name imply ID, all this kind of stuff and it's true for all your classes um, so you want to abide by the academic integrity policy for the college I say all this because I want to keep you all safe I want you all doing this right because um, I, I don't want anyone to run afoul of this right because I mean we all want to do things right and professionally because I'm trying to prepare you to be professionals once you get out of here um, because here it, the penalty isn't you know, that big a deal in terms of, like it's going to impact your grade you may fail something uh, it's going to be reported to the college but if there's not a pattern of that that's probably not going to be that big a deal but once you're in the workplace that's when it can really matter I don't want to see anybody that's been one of my students get fired for something like this um, because whenever you take the ideas of someone else it can lead not only to like you getting fired but it can also lead to legal difficulties you can get sued for in a number of different ways so um, the main idea here is always give credit where credit is due cite and quote things correctly and there's nothing to worry about now continuing some of these reusing skills for the research report uh, think about the expanded definition project and how there's going to be parts of your uh, research report where you're going to need to write expanded definitions about some of the terms that you might be using or some of the ideas concepts that you're talking about so you're not maybe writing an entire expanded definition for the term but there's different aspects of it, like you might need to look up a definition from some different sources and, and quote and cite those as a part of your discussion in your research report. That's totally fine and that's useful to do. Um, also thinking about like the contextual use of, of certain terms might be useful because some of those contextual uses may bear on the problem or the solutions that you're finding in your research similarly the etymology the history of terms because you're looking at the history of this problem if there may be a historical background to like the term that's related to your problem or to one of your solutions that you need to look at because that helps the reader better understand what this thing is what is this problem what are, are these solutions um, the context you know, how that term is used in a given situation might be beneficial for the reader to understand and then as I mentioned before think about this as an argument this is an argumentative essay at its heart where even though you are researching a problem and its solutions the argument of this document is embedded in your recommendations because all that research you've done is led up to the very end to your recommendations because you can't make recommendations that anyone will listen to unless all that research you've done on the problem and the solutions back up what it is you have to say 
So think about, I mean, obviously when you're starting this out, you may not have recommendations in mind yet, but through the research of learning about the problem and learning about different solutions to the problem, you're going to begin to see an argument form about what recommendations you want to make because those recommendations should be based on what seem like the most promising solutions to the given problem that you're researching. All right, so what are next steps? Again, I'm not expecting you to have done or be ready to do these things yet, but you need to be getting prepared uh, to do these things once your research report is completed in draft form. So the next steps uh, will be the presentation and the website. Uh, the presentation is basically a summarization of the main points of your research report. So the research report is giving you all of the information and, and even some of the, the writing that is going to go into what you say, what the bullet points might be that you put on the screen for your presentation. And the presentation really needs to focus on the three main parts of your research report. Identify the problem, give us the highlights on some of those solutions that you found, and then third, what are your recommendations based on this research that you've done? Okay, those are the main parts that go into the presentation. Now the website is something that brings together all parts of the collaborative project. Your website content summarizes your report, so there's going to be uh, things that you likely put into your presentation that you can repurpose again and use on the website. Um, it will also include the embedded video uh, of your presentation, and I'll talk about that again in a second, and also a link to your research report on Google Docs. So we, your research report Unlike the instruction manual where I had you um, publish your document as a web page, with your research report we want to create a shareable link that anyone that has the link can view it. Okay, not edit it, just view it. That way they can see the formatting from you, the different pages. So the formatting that you put into the document will be exactly what they see when they click on that link. And the website brings all this together, like summarizes the research report, but also includes that video and a link to your report on Google Docs. So the collaborative presentation, here's some more information about it that you should put in your notes so you remember these things. Video presentation, let's aim for like five to 10 minutes in length, okay? No less than five minutes, but no more than 10 minutes, okay? This thing doesn't need to like go on forever. If we think of five to 10 minutes in length, you can see here that I have mentioned that you should use a script. I would highly recommend you write out a script that identifies what each person in the team says because with the presentation, all the team members need to have a speaking role. And so you should identify in the script who says what. That's for your benefit. I'm not ever going to see it. It's not going to be seen in your presentation, okay? But you will have it in front of each team member so that you can read along and as other people are doing their parts, but then you know when it's your cue to then say your part for the presentation. Uh, script writing is perfectly fine, especially when you're preparing for like a larger, important presentation uh, professionally that involves like, you know, multiple uh, stakeholders, people that are involved in the presentation. Um, and especially with this being virtual, all online, I don't see any reason not to use a script. It keeps you on point, and also if you use my rule there, two to four pages long, that'll keep you within the time limit. So why two to four pages, right? We know that uh, one page, double spaced of writing, takes about two and a half minutes to say uh, if we're just speaking at a normal leisurely pace like this. So if your script is two pages long, that should be about a five minute long video. If it's four pages long, it should be 10 minutes. If it's three pages, it's gonna be like seven and a half minutes. Um, 
So the idea here is not to, to ad lib, it's not to embellish uh, or go off script, because when you go off script, you add time. Now, with the presentation, I would recommend you practicing this at least once before you actually uh, record it. Or I, I would recommend recording all of the sessions you do, because even a practice session may turn out terrific and you want to save it. Um, but the more times you do it, more than likely will improve the quality of your presentation. Uh, I mentioned that it needs to include all members of the team as speakers. Uh, I mean, some people can say more than others, but everybody should have some part in the script. And you should identify everyone. Make sure that everybody's names are mentioned and that whenever they speak, uh, the previous speaker, you should either indicate orally by saying, and now I'd like to ask the next person and say their name um, will uh, say something about the problem. We'll say something about the solution. The idea here is, and I'll talk more about this maybe next week, is you need to think about how when we're not all together, what we say matters a lot, not just to helping your teammates know when they should begin speaking and doing their part, but it also helps your audience understand what the hell is going on. Because whenever you know, everything's in a video small on the screen and they're just hearing like your voice over like their tinny like you know laptop uh, speaker it can be hard to follow what's going on it's hard to follow who's speaking so the more cues that we can give to our audience helps them better follow along with what it is we're trying to communicate to them so you're know, mentioning people's names in the team um, and you're know, giving them introductions uh, between each uh, speaker, all these types of things help the audience kind of follow along uh, more strongly. Now, the presentation should have a visual component using Google Slides that's shared and controlled by one team member. Um, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. Uh, but basically, I say Google Slides, which is built into Google Drive, which you have access to. So, like here, I'm in Google Drive, I'm in my shared collaborative project folder, and you see here that I, I created by clicking New, Google Slides, it's basically like Microsoft PowerPoint. And I use Google Slides for um, all my presentations and my classes. Uh, but Google Slides is useful to you as opposed to using Microsoft PowerPoint because with Google Slides, everyone can access the slides from inside Google Drive help edit them, help with the writing that you put into there. Um, now I'll talk more later in a future uh, presentation, a future lecture, about what all you should put into it. But just keep in mind now, less is usually more. Uh, what I mean by that is you don't need to put like lots of text. You don't need to put this much text on each slide for your presentations. With the lecture, I'm trying to give you as much information that you can see on the screen at once, that you can pause and jot things down if you want. But with a presentation, people's attention and time are at a premium. So smaller pieces of text on the screen help anchor what it is you say and embellish and explain more through what you say. So a little bit of text on the screen, but you say a whole lot more about that little bit of text that's on the screen. What's on the screen is only to get your audience's attention, help them anchor what it is you're saying to some ideas, but it isn't all the things that you're saying. Now, the way that I suggest you put this together, and if you have other ways of, of you know, creating the video for this presentation, I'm fine with whatever you choose to do, but what I would recommend, as seems to be the easiest way, is you can use Zoom, because you can, you, and again, you don't have to pay for anything, you can use the free account to do this, uh, use Zoom. Uh, one team member uh, would create the meeting for your presentation video, and that person would be called the host. Uh, they would share the screen of the Google Slides before you begin talking. Um, and when they share the screen, uh, you would want to choose to present and go full screen. But then uh, you see these three little dots here. And there's an option here for exit full screen. And what that does is it drops your Google slide into just the frame of your web browser. 
So that way you can just share the web browser instead of doing the whole screen. This lower resolution uh, gives you a little bit more control over the quality of the visual that the audience will see in the background while you're speaking. And basically that one person, they share the Google Slides and then they will advance the slides um, you're using their keyboard or mouse so that they go through the presentation um, while the other members of the team are speaking their parts from your script. Now they'll also record the meeting so they'll save a video to their computer so that they can then edit that or someone in the team can edit it and then upload it either to YouTube or Vimeo so that you can embed the video inside your website later on, which I'll show you how to do later. Um, so that's that's the collaborative presentation in a nutshell. Five to ten minutes, use Google Slides for your visuals just like this, and then you have a script, and one person will arrange a Zoom meeting that everybody joins and everybody speaks their parts during uh, the recording of the meeting. Now, that collaborative website. Uh, I'm not expecting you to go out and buy a domain name, uh, create uh, hosting on DreamHost or any other uh, hosting service. We're just going to use OpenLab. What's cool about using OpenLab is you can create a project profile and project site that you can use for uh, the project. And I'll show you how to do that. Um, but basically, this project site will present a summary of your report's findings. Uh, again, just like the presentation, only the highlights. What are the important points from the research report? You don't have to include everything because obviously you can't. It's going to be too much. Um, so the things that you summarize in your presentation, those are the same bullet points, the same main ideas that you can then copy and paste into your website. And maybe you may need to edit it some, but a lot of the work is already done. And again, think about this, that once you've got the research report done, all the heavy lifting is completed. Everything that goes into the presentation and the website comes from the research report. So if you've done the research report, the presentation and the website are easy because all they are are learning how to use these tools to create these uh, different types of digital deliverables. Um, with the Open Lab Project site, um, you can choose a theme, you can add images, and again, the images, just like in the previous projects, need to be those that you own or that you've made yourself. Uh, you can't use images that you find through Google Image Search or elsewhere. Uh, landing page, um, you will want to embed your presentation video. And the cool thing about OpenLab, because it's based on WordPress, is that it plays very well with different uh, video sharing websites. So basically you can take the link of your video from YouTube or Vimeo and paste it into the content box of you know, the, the landing page on your OpenLab site and it'll automatically embed the video. You don't have to put in any code or anything else, it just works. So you just take that link, copy and paste it, and then boom, your video is going to show up in a little play box. Um, in addition to that video, you'll have a link also to your shared report Google Doc. Uh, again, we're going to share it rather than publish it to the web because sharing a link that is viewable will allow people to see the nice formatting that's going to go into your research report. Um, and the pages that you cre create on the website should include a page for the problem, a page for solutions, uh, a page for recommendations and a page for about the team. Um, basically the problem solutions and recommendations are just short summaries. They can include like full sentences and bullet points of you know, what you found in your research report for those different parts. And then the about the team part should include a list of all the team members. You can include pictures of everyone. You can write a little bio about everyone. Um, it's a way of showing off who's on the team and who contributed to this project. All right, so why don't we back up to the presentation and I'm going to give you all these links and I'm going to show you here. But you know, with the collaborative presentation, I'm going to give you links that go over 
first a link to the Zoom Help Center, which I find incredibly useful. I use this not only for my own web meetings when I got started with it last year, uh, but also when I start doing webinars, which I'm obviously not asking you all to do, but the help section has a lot of good information and how-to information to help you figure Zoom out if you haven't used it in this way before. Uh, but I will share like a link to how to schedule a meeting and they even have like a video here that shows you step by step how to do that. Um, information on joining a meeting, so like how all your team members will join the meeting that you, your point person sets up. Here's a page on how to share your screen, so you'll be able to share the screen of your Google Slides document uh, in, in Zoom. So that'll essentially be what is primarily seen in the Zoom meeting, but there will be smaller video uh, squares for each of the team members. Um, and with this, you know, I'm not requiring you guys to like turn your video on if, if you don't want to or can't, uh, but it does give it a little more polish if you can do that. Um, that but that's up to you if, if you can make that happen or not. But obviously you do need to have audio so that you can speak your parts for your presentation script. And finally here, I'll also give you a link to local recording. And this is whoever sets up the meeting for your team, uh, for your presentation, they'll click the record button that they see at the bottom of their Zoom window. And that'll save a copy of the meeting as a video on their computer, which you can then upload uh, to YouTube or Vimeo um, as um, the video that you will then share uh, on your uh, collaborative project website. So next, let's talk about the collaborative website. And let me just show you how easy it is to get that started. So whoever in your team is going to be the point person for setting up uh, your Open Lab website. Again, this is a WordPress based website. So again, now you're getting more experience with using WordPress, not just Open Lab, because Open Lab doesn't mean anything to anybody outside City Tech for the most part. What matters though is it's based on WordPress technology, which you can make claims about that you know how to create a website using WordPress. So on Open Lab, you need to log in. You can see here that I'm logged in. And then from here, uh, what we need to do first off is we go to my Open Lab and then go down to my projects. Okay, my projects. Now, on my projects, you might not have anything here yet. That's fine. But what you want to do is click this plus sign next to create slash clone a project. So I'm going to click create clone a project. And what I'm going to do is leave this at default, create a new project, scroll down, project name required. And so for this, uh, it needs to be under 50 characters, but it needs to clearly identify your project so others will be able to find it more easily. Um, what I would suggest for your project name uh, would be something related to um, what your research report title will be. Uh, so you could say, uh, research report on, let's say, um, just looking around for some ideas, on hard drive storage capacity limitations. I don't know, that, that's, that's a technical problem. So you need to say research report on, and then what is the problem that you're investigating? Now, in the project description, that's where you have a little more space to write you know, what's going on with this project. Here, you should say something that you know, this project is uh, for an assignment and Professor Ellis's spring 2021 Driving class. It is a collaborative project 
by and include all the team members' names there. So that way that you can say like who all is involved. Shared settings, don't mess with that. Just leave that unchecked. Uh, project contact, this will default to whoever is your point person. That's, the, that's going to be the administrator for the project. And so just leave that how it is. You don't have to add another uh, member there right now. Um, is your project associated with one or more of the college's schools? So here you can choose that um, it is arts and sciences, and then in arts and sciences is English. Arts and sciences, then English. Uh, category, college, community, we'll say this is coursework. Site details. This is important. Put a check next to set up a site. And that opens up this space down here. Create a new site. Now, what it's asking for here is what will be the URL for your project. And so, th because this is a URL, it should have no spaces between any of the letters, right? You know, when you look at a URL, there's no spaces up there. It's all together. So, here, um, you can put in anything that you want. Obviously, it needs to be appropriate and professional, um, but you could just simply say, like, research report on X. And then the X is like, what is like the one word or two words maybe of what your problem is? Um, and just, you see how I use dashes for spaces. That's totally fine. Now, after you've done that, um, we'll click on Create Project and Continue. Privacy settings. Uh, you want to choose that this is a public project so that anybody, you know, especially me, can see this without having to join your site. So leave that as public project. Uh, privacy settings, project site. Uh, I would recommend leaving it to public to allow search engines to index this site uh, because when you ask search engines not to index the site, many search engines will do that anyways. The, you know, uh, no robots tag doesn't really mean anything anymore. Um, don't set it to private and don't set it to hidden. Okay, It has to be one of these options under public. Uh, member role settings, you can leave these as they are and then click next step. You can upload an avatar. This would be like the little picture, like with you know, our class is either the painting I did of the finger pushing the button on the laptop or the red background of the guy pointing off to the left. Um, you can put whatever you know, avatar you want there or at this point you, you can change this later. So you don't have to do anything next right now. So you just hit next step. Now here you can search for members to invite. So whoever's setting this up um, can choose uh, to ty begin typing in the names of the members of your team because all of you are on Open Lab, so it should be relatively easy to find your other team members and add them to this uh, site. So like if I were to say, So like my colleague, Patrick Corbett, I just start typing in Patrick Core, and you can see here it, it found him. So I click his name, and that adds him as someone uh, to my site. I'm going to remove him from there. Uh, but you just begin typing, and then you'll be able to find the names of all your teammates. But make sure you're choosing the right teammate, um, because you several people may share the same name um, at our school um, and so you could always have people join the site later uh, just like you joined uh, our class site remember how you found the site on open lab click join now and then you became a member of it um, but after you've added people this way click finish and then that's going to automatically send a message to your teammates that they need to click on to actually join your project site. Okay, so make sure all the team members look for that, click the link, and then they'll be added. 
Um, otherwise, they can navigate to this site and you can just share this link up here if you want. You just copy this link, copy, and send an email or a WhatsApp message or uh, Slack, Discord, whatever you're using. Send a message with that link. Everybody can find it and then they can join. Now, this right here, this is not your site. This is what is called the profile. The actual site is over here on the right, just like with our course site, uh, visit project site. So you click that. And that takes you to the prototype, uh, the, the basic template layout for your site. Uh, and from here, you can see, like you already has a couple of pages, like about a sample page, a sample sub page. But all, are the, all of these things are things you can change. And in a future lecture, we'll go into a little more detail about all this stuff. Um, but if you want to go ahead and begin playing around with it, you can go ahead and create one of these project uh, profile slash sites. So you have a site you can begin working on. And where you, all the magic happens for this is you mouse over the top research report on hard drive storage here and click on dashboard. In the dashboard, you're able to change things like the appearance, the themes that you want to use. You can add plugins that can change the behavior of your uh, OpenLab site, the WordPress-based site. Pages, pages where you go to add pages that are at the top of the page that people can click on for your problem, your solutions, your recommendations, and about the team. Those will be individual pages that you'll need to add, and you'll need to get rid of uh, these other pages. So like if I go pages, all pages, about, sample page, sample sub page, those you need to delete. Um, and then you'll add new pages that will be added to the top of your site. After you've added pages here, just as a, I'll mention this in a future lecture, but just to give you a heads up, um, because this is based on WordPress, it may not automatically pick up the fact that you've added pages that need to be added to your menu at the top. In which case you go to Appearance over here on the left, and then click on Menus. And here in the Menus, you have pages over here on the left. Here I'm going to click View All, and I can add these. I just put a check next to what I want, add the menu, and it pops it over here on the right. And over here on the right, I can drag things around to get it in the order that I want it to appear in at the top of my page. After I've done that, I click Save Menu, bam, done. I got a new menu uh, operational on my um, project site. But I'll go into more detail on that in a future lecture. I just want to give you guys um, you know, a little taste of what these different things are. But now I'll also give you this week uh, a couple of sample links to um, different student projects from previous technical writing classes that I've taught. Um, here is one example, and, and these are examples that do good things and, and some things that still need work, um, but they certainly are trying. And that's really great that, they, that they've done as much as they have on these different projects. Um, but they show you the main parts of the different um, project uh, that you know, I've been talking about. Um, they created pages like for about, an introduction page, a problem page. Um, but see, they didn't get rid of that sample sub page. So again, I'll go over some ways of like making this more polished. Um, but these are smaller problems. I don't want anybody to get too involved in the website. The research report is where you should be putting most of your energy at. Um, this is a smaller part of the overall effort. But you see here on the very first landing page, the very first thing that we see is a link to their, um, oh actually this is a link to this video. I guess they wanted to make sure that, that we were able to get to the video if it didn't embed, but you can see it embedded properly. Um, they had a problem getting everyone together, so they actually broke their um, um, video into two parts. Not ideal, but you know this is trying to work around a problem, right? And then 
Here they gave a link to their analytical research report, which is what I did ask for. And then that takes us over to their Google Doc um, of their uh, research report. Here's another student project uh, on quantum computing. And so here they talk about problems, here they have solutions. You would have another page over here for recommendations, okay? And then underneath that, they give a, a short uh, summary, like an abstract of their project. They gave a link to their report on Google Docs. And then here they gave a single video, the way ideally you want to do this, uh, that includes their Google Slides in the background. And you can see here on the side are like video, um, little postage size stamp versions of themselves or avatars, depending on who's talking during the presentation. So I'll give you links to these as well for you to take a look at just to get some inspiration and ideas and also just to your temper your, um, your what you think my expectations are on the projects. So again I'm not trying to overburden you I'm just wanting to make sure that you're producing some good work that you know, satisfies the requirements for the class and that you can carry out of our class as examples of your communication and teamwork skills. So, what do we have for next week? Uh, so, for homework, I want you to research. You need to be writing your report draft at this point, and you need to delegate other responsibilities. Um, and so, for your weekly writing assignment, I want you as a team to have another you know, powwow all together. You can do it asynchronously or synchronously, depending on what your schedules are like. But based on what you talk about, I want you to write a short memo together. So just one memo from your whole team uh, that is written to me and identifies who is taking point on the research report, who is organizing the presentation, and who is setting up your Open Lab project site. Now, again, you can have people double up if you want, but I really would encourage you different people in the team to take on different responsibilities. And you don't necessarily have to be a pro about these things. This is an opportunity to learn. Because I'm giving you links that give you a lot of information about this stuff if you've never used some of these tools before. Um, so this is also an opportunity for you to learn something new and then be able to show that off by helping your team out. And of course your team can help you. This isn't, your delegating responsibility doesn't mean that you're doing this all by yourself. All of the team members still need to be involved in helping out as much as they can. But with delegating these responsibilities, you're having one person take point, uh, meaning that they're going to try to direct people to get the thing done, set up times for a meeting, be able to work Zoom or create the Google Slides document, um, they're the ones that like bring it together, but they're not the ones doing all the work. That comes from all the team members, but they're responsible for working with the team members to bring that work together. Um, now, in this memo, after you've identified who's taking point on these different parts of the project, uh, I want you to I want each team member, okay, to copy and paste that memo into a comment on our open lab site for the weekly writing assignment. So like if your team has four members, I need to see that memo four times, one time from each member. That way you each get credit for having done this work on the weekly writing assignment. Because this is a collaborative writing assignment where all the team members need to be together uh, to contribute to it based on the discussion and then the actual writing of the memo. Um, those folks that don't you know, copy and paste the memo, you don't get credit for the weekly writing assignment part. So make sure that you go into your Google Drive folder wherever you wrote this thing at and copy it uh, and then paste it into a comment for this week's weekly writing assignment. So all team members need to copy and paste it. Um, and again, all your writing needs to be saved in your Google Drive folder. Okay, That's where everybody can access this stuff. Uh, so make sure that you're saving it so that everyone uh, can get access to it. Uh, then the next week we'll review some of these things we talked about this week, um, do some troubleshooting, uh, give you some more ideas, more details about like you know with the Zoom um, 
presentation video uh, and also about building your open lab site. Um, and also just another reminder, make sure that you do fill out those um, evaluation, course evaluation um, surveys. Very useful to me, very helpful. And written comments are appreciated. If you like the class, let me know. If there's things you think I need to improve or change about it, let me know that too. All that's really great. Uh, and I appreciate that. So remember, um, for this week, I got office hours Wednesday, 3 to 5 on Google Hangouts. The link is on our Open Lab site uh, on the syllabus. Um, also, if you make an appointment to see me, make sure that you make the appointment. Um, if you can't make the appointment, just send me an email letting me know that you're not going to be there. It's not a big deal, but that's just being professional um, if, you, if you can't make it for whatever reason. Um, but I, again, I want to encourage you to make a meeting with me if you can't come during the Wednesday 3 to 5 office hours. Uh, my email address is right there, jls.citytech.cuny.edu. Uh, oh, last one thing I just wanted to mention. Um, I've always mentioned my blog here, and I don't update it as often as I, I would like to. Uh, but I did do a new post over this weekend that may be interesting to some of you folks since you're like CST and electrical engineering uh, majors. Um, I posted a write-up about some updates that I made to my new desktop computer, a uh, Lenovo Idea Center 5, real tiny desktop. Uh, and really, this is like a brand new world for me because like all of my PCs that I've had for at least the last 20 years have been PCs that I've built. Um, but I really wanted uh, an OEM only processor that either you can only buy in a Lenovo or an HP desktop, um, an AMD Ryzen 7 4700G. It's essentially like a 3700X. Uh, 8 core 16 threads but it also has integrated graphics because uh, I later I might build a mini ITX system um, using a, uh, you know, a more feature rich motherboard than what you can imagine is in a Lenovo um, but you can't buy that processor by itself unless you want to like you know, pay more than it's worth from like an overseas shipper um, so anyways I uh, wrote up some of my experiences, like the, the thinking that went into why I bought this particular machine. Uh, I talked about installing Linux Mint on it and you know, how easy that was. I uh, talked about maxing out the heart, you know, the RAM in it, and so it went from 16 gigs to 32 gigs because it only has two DDR4 3200 slots. Um, swapped out hard drives because it came with a one terabyte hard disk drive. I put in my four terabyte uh, drive in there. Uh, but most, the funnest part of it was changing out the heat sink and fan. Because um, the heat sink and fan on, on the Lenovo is definitely stronger than a comparable HP system with the 4700G processor. Um, but because I'm using this to like render these videos that I make for you guys every week, uh, you can imagine um, there's times where the CPU is going to thermally throttle itself because the temperatures go up. So it's going to drop the voltage and you know, obviously the clock rate is going to go down so it can cool off before speeding back up again. And that's largely because the heat sink and fan that came with it is not really designed for uh, the processor. Even though the processor is rated at 65 watt uh, TDP, um, you know, it really it puts out a little more you know, than that I think. It needs a, a more advanced heat sink and fan to get that heat off, to transfer that heat out into the environment. Uh, so I, I, but the, one of the problems, because this is a Lenovo, and you guys are probably thinking like, Professor Ellis has really gone off the deep end, why the hell is he talking about all this? You don't have to listen to this part of the lecture, but this may be interesting to some of you, um, is that there's not a lot of room to work with inside that case. It's a very, very tiny case. Um, so the best thing that I could find that would fit is this 47 millimeter high Silverstone uh, AR11 uh, four heat pipe uh, heat sink with a 92 millimeter fan on top. Um, and I thought everything was going great uh, when I was installing it because I, I knew I was going to have to pull the motherboard out. So I had to totally disassemble the computer, take everything out of it. Um, but then I discovered these guys. Uh, these are actually riveted lugs built into the chassis for the heat sink and fan. Um, and so for me to use an aftermarket heat sink and fan, there's no way that I could attach them to these lugs. 
because uh, it had nuts that needed to go on the back side of the motherboard. Uh, that's the way it would attach. There was no way to adjust the screws uh, that were coming out of the heatsink. So after a little bit of thought, thankfully I, I remembered I had a quarter inch drill bit um, that I was able to use to drill out each of those lugs. And you can see it basically left a bushing uh, of each of the lugs left over and of course all these shavings which I vacuumed up. And then of course then I had all the room I needed for my nuts that would hold on my new heat sink and fan. So I got that put on and back in operation because otherwise I wouldn't be recording this lecture for you right now. Um, but you know this kind of thing that I put on uh, my blog is the kind of thing that I would encourage you all to consider doing as a way of documenting the work that you do with computers, with different technologies that you're interested in, um, because this is a way that you can show off what you know how to do. Uh, for me, it's, you know, this is my hobby. It's something I enjoy doing and, and being able to share these ideas because you can imagine when I do work on my computer, I look at a lot of websites and learn a lot from what other people share. Uh, and so this is a way of me giving back to the community to show off what I did, what worked, what didn't work, uh, what were the challenges that I faced, how did I overcome them, that kind of stuff. Uh, because I know from my own reading that the writing of others helped me, I want to help someone else in return. But for you all, being technologists that are going into a technical field, this kind of thing is a way of being able to show off uh, what you know how to do and that you know how to communicate that in an effective way. Um, so I highly recommend you, you, I'm not saying you need to go out and do this exact same thing I did, but think of different ways that you might be able to share uh, what you're doing online. It could be on your LinkedIn.com um, profile, it can be on your own personal website, uh, it can be simply using Google Docs and publishing up your, your writing as a web page that you can then link from social media or from LinkedIn.com. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can accomplish the same thing without you know, registering a domain name uh, if that's not something in the cards for you right now. So just you know, something for you to think about uh, that maybe um, could open some doors for you later on. So again, um, contact me if you got questions. Make sure that you're masking up, maintaining social distance, get plenty of rest, eat well, take care of yourselves, take care of others. Um, play it safe as much as you can uh, and if you get that chance for a vaccine jump on it get that thing uh, done because that's going to protect you and protect those around you which is like super important to keep in mind about this if we're going to get through the pandemic um, so I uh, hope everybody's doing well hang in there you know, stay communicating with your teams as well uh, because you're all in this together you need to work together to pull this off I know my other students have done it in the past I know that you can do it as well because you're just as smart and you're just as energetic, got all the same kind of your motivations they got, uh, but you just got to see it through. And any way that I can help you do that, reach out to me. Okay? So take care.